Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the latest edition of the Predict IBD podcast. Um, thanks so much for joining us uh, again today. Um, in today's episode, we've got Nick, Phil, and Kate. That is Nick Pleveris, um, who's one of the gastroenterology clinical research fellows working with me at the Western General in Edinburgh. Um, that's Phil Jenkinson, who's um, another one of our IBD fellows. Phil's a, a surgeon um, in training from Inverness. And Kate Koval, who's our research nurse extraordinaire. And what they're going to do today is they're going to talk about the baseline data set from Predict um, and the patient journey. Um, and just before they get stuck in, I think it's really important that I just put um, a flag for the Predict study sponsors, without whom the study would just not be possible. So that is Cure Crohn's and Colitis, um, 3CS. Um, and the Chief Scientist's Office. Um, there are many others that have contributed to the success of the study, but it's with these three major funders that this is all possible. So without further ado, um, we'll go into conversation with Nick, Phil and Kate. Thanks, guys. So, Kate, uh, can you tell us how patients with IBD uh, generally find out about the PREDICT study? Um, there's a variety of ways. The social media we use a lot um, for patients to get in touch with us. So things like Facebook, Twitter, um, they can email us, they can see posters in the clinics when they go for their regular IBD appointments and then they can email us or call us and we'll get in touch with them. Nick, so uh, who's eligible for uh, PREDICT? So, yeah, so we've, we've tried, you know, purposely to make this as an inclusive study as possible. And um, as such, you know, the, the eligibility criteria are pretty simple. So um, our age cutoff, so it's anyone above the age of six years old. Yeah. Um, and essentially you have to be in what we call remission. So, um, you know, the patient feels that their disease is well controlled. And the other criteria that um, we ask for is that there have been no recent changes, any of their medications, or, you know, they haven't started any new medications for, for, for their condition. So, you know, very simple. Um, you know, most, you know, a lot of the patients that we see day in, day out, be it in clinic or um, who are in the hospital can, can, can join the study. Uh, for patients who have ulcerative colitis, if they've had a colectomy, can they uh, take part in the study? So, so the answer to that is no. Um, you know, the simple answer. Um, generally, patients who've had a colectomy, um, um, you know, we, we would not include um, in, in this study. So it's the only population that we wouldn't... Not, not at the moment. <laughs> not at the moment, yeah. No, that, that's, you know, that, that, that's, a, that's a great point, is that, you know, the... This the individuals who've had colectomy are great, you know, very interesting from a research point of view. Um, especially patients, for example, have gone on to have pouches. Um, you know, that would be a great study in the future. So I suppose watch this space. So, Kate, uh, can you tell us what happens when a patient uh, who is eligible um, has been identified either by themselves, getting in touch with you, or by their doctor in the clinic? Uh, can you tell us what happens uh, for them to? Uh, actually get going um, Okay, it's a, it's a pretty simple um, process and you know, with recruiting the patients whether it's in clinic or through social media, we find that the patients are really invested because ultimately the benefits um, of the study will be for themselves directly and when you start talking to patients about what causes their flares, um, they all have their own theories and we're there to try and um, justify or find out really what the causes are. So once they've um, said they're interested in joining the PREDICT study, we will get in touch with them and arrange a mutually convenient time either to be seen at the routine clinic uh, when they see their IBD doctor or another time um, I can go down and meet them. And the process takes about 20 minutes. And thereafter, um, we don't see the patients again. Everything is done completely online and they mail in um, their samples that we ask for. And that's the process really um, from start to finish. It's up to the patients to continue um, contributing to the study. So it's a, quite a lot of uh, information that we gather from the patients. Um, so it's mainly sta uh, samples of uh, stool and of saliva for DNA that we gather mm -hmm. and lots of questionnaires. Nick, can you talk us through the, the information that we gather from, uh, from the questionnaires? Yeah, so so we gather a whole heap of information. You know, it's um, 
um, lots and lots of data that's going to be generated. Um, so I suppose, you know, you can split it up into different categories. Um, there's the sort of clinical stuff. Um, so that that's in terms of, you know, what kind of disease they have, um, how long they've had it for, do they have history of operations, um, any medications that they're on. Uh, and, and the other things that we collect are um, sort of blood samples as well, and that's part of the, the patient's routine care as such. So we look at various um, blood tests that may indicate, for example, inflammation um, in, in the body. Um, the other thing, as you mentioned, was the, the stool samples, and, and, and one thing we're collecting all our, our, our patients are a stool sample called calprotectin. So that that's a, a good indicator of how much inflammation is in is in uh, mm -hmm. someone's bowel as a result of active inflammatory bowel disease. Um, so you know that that's the sort of clinical stuff that we're, that, that that we're looking at. But you know the the real interesting stuff as well is the the, the stuff that the patients report, and 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 by that I mean you know the, the questionnaires have loads of questions different things like quality of life uh, they have questions on sleep um which you know we, we we always hear from patients that this is important for them um but we, we don't know much about sleep and ibd things about stress things about travel um things about for example over-the-counter medications and herbal remedies you know so that that's a really you know interesting part to this study and then the other huge thing is the sort of food and dietary data that we're collecting um and and you know there's multiple aspects to that um and and i'm sure kate will will, will show, show us a few things about you know and, and how we're going about that but you know mainly we're collecting lots of detailed information about patients diet um to the point where we're um doing what we call food diaries so that's when you actually weigh what you've been eating for for you know we're doing it for a four-day period uh, and it allows you to really sort of get a, a much deeper and better idea of, 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 of someone's diet so the, the main point of the PREDICT study is to try and work out the reasons uh, and things that contribute to a patient having a flare. Mm -hmm. uh, so what actually happens if the patient um, experiences a flare? Um, how do they get in touch with us if it's, uh, as you mentioned, there's no further physical contact with mm -hmm. the study team? Well, this is part of the online process that they do. When they do their monthly questionnaire, they will be asked um, if they have been well in the preceding month. And if not, we will ask them further information. You know, what happened um, during your flare? You know, were you hospitalised? Did you get additional medication? Um, things like that would capture. And we also ask them to send in another sample, um, a typical one that all IBD patients usually get. And we mail that in, everything is paid for, and then we can directly compare what's happening in their gut when they're having a flare as compared to the beginning at the baseline when they sent in a sample and they were well. So that's really important that the patient continues um, to keep us up to date and also send in the specimens as well. And then as Nick had said about the food diary, it's really the only piece of paper that they have to fill in. Um, the University of Aberdeen have kindly put together a fabulous diary and it is only for four days, even though the study is for two years, they um, measure and weigh all their food and drink for four days. And at the end of the four days, we ask them for their sample um, to be mailed in the post. And it was interesting what Nick had said about um, the cause of flares, which is exactly what we're looking at. But people volunteer that information. They've all got their theories and having spoken to probably about 500 patients, you know, a lot of the men say, oh, it was stress. It was stress. And I think typically as a society, we don't think a men being stressed, but they'll see things like, oh, it was the birth of um, my first child or I started my own business and um, things like that. So we're trying to capture all that to prove our patients' theories. And, and I think that's right, isn't it? That, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes I think we can be quite scientific in our approaches mm -hmm. and, and actually just asking the person in front of you, what, you know, what do you feel, what do you feel is, mm -hmm. is, causing causing your 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 disease your disease to get worse mm -hmm. and 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 the thing we hear over and over again is you know it's definitely something to do with my diet yeah or it's because i've been on a big business trip and i've traveled loads changing time zones um you know as you said things like stress mm -hmm. you know i've started a new job i've new moved house all, all, all these things that 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 you know actually we don't know much about it may be because it's difficult to actually get 
accurate information about mm-hmm. these things. But you know, it's mm-hmm. it's it's the big thing that we've tried to to capture as much information as possible in, th- in this study to really help us gain of understanding, uh, you know, of these factors. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what draws the patients in. You know, they, they feel that, you know, this is a study that they they want to be involved in, they want to succeed because it will answer some of the questions mm-hmm. that they've had for so long. That is the most uh, frustrating question to be asked in clinic is, doctor, what should I eat yeah. uh, to help my uh, IBD? Because we can't uh, give them the answer. Even explain it, there's no um, scientific, scientific evidence mm-hmm. uh, out there to answer that question. Uh-huh it's still a, a huge gap yeah. and it, it doesn't instill faith. Well, well, that's the problem. There's nothing scientific. But if you Google, you know, IBD and diets, there's thousands or thousands upon hits saying this is what you should be and this is what you shouldn't do. And, you know, often patients are laid down that path because they're so desperate to find a cure, if you like, of what's, what's going to help me. And we are trying to do it scientifically. Yeah, exactly. And, and mm-hmm. um you know diet you know is is a big thing mm-hmm. i think and the one thing that i like about predict is that a lot of uh, you know diet studies are difficult because you ask patients to tell you what they've eaten in the last mm-hmm. you know few months for example but the fact that we're doing this weighed food diary gives a very accurate mm-hmm. you know this is what the person is uh-huh. eating so so it's it's a it's a you know that one step further to gain better and, information and, and patients often you know keep their own food diaries anyway so it's not really a big step to do that so when they come for the recruitment um we give them the pack. We give them everything they could possibly need. So it's the food diary, as I mentioned, the scales. We provide the scales as a gift from us. They get to keep them forever and ever. And then we ask them to send in um, three samples of their stool. Again, we give them the kits for that. And then we also look at patients' DNA because a lot of patients will say, oh, well, my aunt had you know, Crohn's or colitis or my brother had. So we're specifically looking... Um, at DNA markers. So to do that, it's a very simple process. Um, you spit into a tube and then that goes in the post as well. Does the patient have to tell the postman uh, what they're what they're posting back? No, they don't have to. And if somebody decides to steal one of these packs, they won't be very <laughs> chuffed. <laughs> but uh, no, they don't have to. It's all got labelled properly and prepaid and it comes straight to our labs um, in Edinburgh. So it's very straightforward. So it you don't need to have to go to the post office, any mailbox, they'll take them. And the feedback so far, you know, a patient's finding it pretty straightforward, pretty easy to do. Very, they love the fact that it's online and they can do it, you know, when they're on their bus journey, when they're at work. They can just log in, fill in their questionnaire and that's it done. And we, of course, we send reminders as well. Everything's automated. They get reminders to say, please do your questionnaire. Have you been well? Very straightforward. Great. Thank, Thank you. Thanks. Well, thank you all. Thank you all for listening. Goodbye. <laughs>